I want to clarify one of the um, really terrific things about this generous grant is that it lets us uh, support two graduate students who are working on their dissertations. Um, and you're going to hear from both of them in this afternoon session. Uh, Nicole Lamato is going to introduce uh, Rachel Williams. And then um, following Rachel's uh, presentation and, and some time for Q&A, uh, we're going to, just to remind everyone, we're going to have a panel discussion with, with each of our guests. Uh, led by Matthew Griffin, the other graduate student who the Mellon um, Sawyer Seminar is supporting. So, uh, Nicole, please oh. introduce. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, am I close enough? Can people hear me on the mic? Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm Nikki Amato and I'm a doctoral candidate in the College of Education and I'm so excited and honored to introduce our next speaker, Rachel Marie Crane Williams. Rachel was my professor in a sequential art class. She's currently a member of my dissertation committee and is a forever mentor in all things teaching, research, and moving through the world boldly and confidently. Rachel was a tenured professor at the University of Iowa in the Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies Department and in the School of Art and Art History. Last year, Rachel left us to lead students and faculty as the Dean of the Division of Liberal Arts in the University of North Carolina at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. To say she is missed is an understatement. While in Iowa, Rachel worked closely with the Iowa Women's Correctional Facility. Her scholarship amplifies the voices of incarcerated women and exposes the systemic injustices of the prison industrial complex through art and comics. Her scholarship art has critical implications for engaging in qualitative inquiry, articulating positionalities, and telling counter stories. As I think about Julian's talk this morning and his recovery of stories about Gus Henderson and Oscar Mack, and yesterday, Laura's recovery of Nesta Rodondo, it's clear that comics remain a subversive and transformative medium for uncovering and recovering histories, past and present, of racial and colonial violence. Comics' ability to reckon with racism is exactly the reason the medium continues to meet resistance in K-12 public schools. Rachel's latest books are two examples of texts that are critically important recoveries. Run Home If You Don't Want It To Be Killed, The Detroit Uprising of 1943, was published last year by UNC Press and the Duke Center for Documentary Studies, and LG for Mary Turner, An Illustrated Account of a Lynching, was published by Verso Books. When Rachel's not hustling across campuses and motorcycling over state lines, you can find her doodling and painting in her sketchbook, capturing the quiet moments and slices of life around her. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Marie Williams. Of course, she runs away before I can hug her neck. No. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> mm, the best. Um, okay, so I was telling uh, Nikki, and I already fussed at Corey and Anna because I really wish that they had put me at 6.30 in the morning um, the day before everyone came and before Laura and Julian blew our minds. So um, I'm going to do the best I can to follow in their amazing footsteps. Um, the other thing that you all will see is that even though I'm an artist, I'm the most boring PowerPoint creator in the world. So uh, after seeing their PowerPoints, I hope you're not um, disappointed. First, I want to say thank you and yay for libraries. Um, I could never, I know, do... Any of the work that I do without archivists and librarians, I think they are the most amazing people on the planet. I want to say thank you. Being part of the Mellon Sawyer Seminar has just been a creative and amazing, and sort of like when we talk about recovery, it's kind of, for me, these trips to Iowa City are like this recovery of my soul, just being with people that I love. Um, now I'm going to cry. And then, <laughs> and I want to thank um, Esther and Anna and Corey as well. Um, so, this is the cover of my book, Run Home If You Don't Want to Be Killed, and that's mostly what I'm going to talk about today. There's a lot of things that I really thought, like, what would I like to talk about? And um, I think this is probably, maybe, might end up being my life, life's work, which is kind of sad. But, um, so, uh, I'm going to talk today about a graphic historiography of the Detroit Uprising of 1943. And most people are familiar with Detroit, and when you say uprising, they think of the rebellion in 1967. They don't automatically think of 1943. Um, so, what I'm going to share today is a reflexive account of creating this book. Um, and I want to talk about the process of combining images, stories, and research 
um, into this graphic historiography. I also want to talk about why stories like this are really important. Um, and they're really important now more than ever. I mean, I think what Julian said about recovery is really, and the future, um, really struck me today. So it's really a little known fact that in 1943, large scale instances of interracial violence broke out across the country. The most well known instances occurred in Beaumont, Texas, um, Los Angeles, California, Harlem, New York, and of course, Detroit. Not since the red summer of 1919 have there been such outright racial violence and turmoil mixed with wartime tension on the home front. The events are significant because of the geographical location, the number and demographics of people living in Detroit at the time, the economic and domestic situations of many people, um, and the residents, the government response, and the aftermath. The history of blackness in America allowed the mob and police to deny the humanity of their victims. The history of blackness and the ways that science, religion, law, and white culture regarded blackness as inferior made the violence and aftermath of continued oppression possible. The questions this paper seeks to address are as follows. Is the graphic text an appropriate form for qualitative inquiry? How does the genre of graphic novels function to provide opportunities for readers to create new meetings and interpret historical events? What has meaning when historical accounts are placed side by side, truth is contested, and time has overturned, plowed under, fertilized, resurrected, and reshaped regimes built on power, greed, fear, prejudice, ignorance, dishonesty, over and over. Essentially, how can a graphic text like Run Home be used effectively to tell stories that matter, to document and illuminate voices that have been ignored or buried in the archives and generate new knowledge? Other questions I explore are, what are the roles of artists and researchers in our current context as public intellectuals? How does this work fit under arts-based research methods described by Sullivan, Eisner, and Barone? What comparisons can be drawn between the creation of film, poetry, creative nonfiction, and graphic texts when standing in the space of qualitative research and historiography in the academy? Is the academy ready to accept the production of high-quality research-oriented graphic texts as an outcome of interdisciplinary scholarship and creative inquiry? How can graphic texts help readers grapple with history, race, and violence? How can graphic texts remind readers that historical experiences are also visceral, embodied, and lived out by real people in real time with real consequences? Um, so uh, the framework I use to build the scaffold for this work is narrative theory, interpretive research, and feminist methods of qualitative research. I chose a variety of narratives from different people affected by the violence in order to tell a story that uncovers why race and gender matter. The stories of Detroit citizens affected by the uprising offer an opportunity for us in the present time to examine the social, economic, and cultural pressures that gave way to violence on the eve of the end of World War II and the beginning of the American Civil Rights Movement. It's a story of racial capitalism, a term professor, where's Laura, I can't see up here, that Laura introduced to us yesterday, um, and she shared and illustrated it so eloquently with the story of Nesta Redondo. Melissa Harris Perry, the founding director of the Anna Julia Cooper Project at Tulane, writes, this was in 2003, historical accounts in race research rarely occur, but when they do, they're often inaccurate or incomplete because of the failure to account for the role of African Americans. She calls for researchers to produce accounts which describe not only multiracial context, but also the ways that gender plays into culture, history, and sociology. She believes that historical researchers should not assume that people's values are stagnant or that particular groups can be seen as monolithic in their value system. For example, in the 1940s, white people surveyed held very different beliefs and lived in a culture that shifted drastically over the course of 30 years. Those surveyed after the civil rights movement hold a, held a different set of values that reflect the shift. With the election of Trump, the United States saw a swing back to pre-civil rights culture that proudly holds up white supremacy and heteropatriarchy and enforces them through oppressive policy and lawmaking and political, economic, and social violence. So this poster is from 1942, and what's terrifying is honestly there are such parallels to things that people have seen and found that have been posted in our very short, you know, now, currently. So, um, and, you know, this... I could spend an entire year talking just about this poster alone as a piece of, um, you know, culture and really how it reflects uh, not only what was happening in Detroit, but, uh, but the United States overall. 
Um, the piece that I was looking for that I could not find is this poster, uh, or not, it's not really a poster, it was like a, a giant billboard that was handmade, and it was set across from the Sojourner Truth, where the, the site of the Sojourner Truth housing project was going to be, and it said, we want white tenants. Um, and so I, I could not find that one, but I thought this was actually uh, worse. Um, and more telling in many ways of what was actually happening in that space. Um, so uh, Cheryl Glenn writes, historiography's central question is not true or false. Instead, historiography asks us to consider questions of knowledge. In what context is it produced and normalized? Whom does it benefit? Ethics. To who, to what and whom are these practices accountable? What and who do they privilege and power? What practices might produce historical remembrances and what are the effects of such representation? At the nexus of these questions resides issues of historical evidence. What counts, what's available, who provided and preserved it and why, and how and to what end has it been used and by whom? Thus history is not frozen, not merely the past. It provides an approachable, disruptable ground for engaging and transforming traditional memory or practice in the interest of both the present and the future. Um, one of the things that came, that really, you know, I'm a traditional academic, so if I'm going to do a project, the first thing I do is try to find and, and just find every book I can and then put it under my pillow as though osmosis will make it sink into my thick skull. And I do eventually read everything, but I read it in pieces and parts and go back and fold and highlight, and, you know, these kinds of things. And I feel like if I read everything, then maybe I will understand things. And what was really interesting in most of the accounts I read about this, most of them were written by white men. Most of them were sociologists at the time. They had a very particular, or criminologists, which I find very interesting. Um, but the archive of the NAACP, it's referenced, it comes up, but it's never really brought out and explored in a deep, deep way, um, except, of course, by the NAACP. And there were such rich accounts of what happened, and many of them were, were you know, women came and told folks what had happened, and their voices were absolutely, you know, in those accounts in the 1940s and moving forward, were kind of ignored by a lot of scholars. I mean, there were a number of black feminist historians who did reference that work, but it was amazing to me that you had this entire event that happened, and then that whole segment was just, their voices were sort of ignored and wiped out, even though it existed and was a beautiful archive. Um, so Robert Rosenstone, in an effort to reconcile the experience of working in film as a historian, writes, despite the success of our new methodologies, I fear that as a profession we know less and less about how to tell stories that situate us meaningfully in a value-laden world. Stories that matter to people outside of our profession, stories that matter to people inside of the pr profession, stories that matter at all. He goes on to write, now it seems time for such a shift in perspective, one occasioned by the opportunity to represent the world in images and words rather than words alone, to touch history. Doing so will open us up to new notions of the past, make us ask once more the questions about what history can or cannot be and about what history is, about what we want to know about the past and what we will do with that knowledge. One of the goals of this project was to heighten the awareness of social history and transform the way that readers see culture and their place within the larger historical narrative. Much of what had been written about Detroit was about white male sociologists, criminologists, this kind of thing. And so, again, you know, my point is that a number of accounts completely were not really um, part of the history of what happened in 1943. Um, it's my hope that run home helps readers to better understand the lives of others and, and to overlay it with their own lives and the culture of the present. So when Julian was talking about the metaverse, you know, in my mind, I do hope people have that kind of experience where they think back and forth, you know, and can draw and see parallels um, and really are able to answer for themselves, why, do, why should I know this? Why does it matter? Um, and there's just such loops historically, um, where we retread, retread, retread the same sort of things over and over. It's just, it's kind of fascinating. Um, so, history can be interpreted as a spiral of events in which the meaning continues to shift in light of new interpretations. 
We should not sanitize history lest we forget how people's responses to hatred have shaped our current society, expanded civil rights, made art more powerful, and made life more tolerable. By exploring the context of the Detroit uprising of 1943 through images and stories, I hope to offer readers an opportunity to interrogate their own images of the United States now and during World War II and ways in which race and gender were and still are used as an excuse for oppression, violence, and exclusion. So one of the things I really want to think about is what is the role of artists in society and what are the roles of researchers? Is it to bring light new knowledge or to gather and analyze bits of information and synthesize them into something digestible and meaningful? As a researcher and artist, I've often experienced a sense of ontological insecurity, which I have felt so deeply at this conference after listening to my brilliant colleagues. <laughs> um, so... Uh, uh, in order to assuage this, assuage this constant questioning, I have to turn to work that satisfies my need to conduct deep research spurred by meaningful questions and represent that experience through image, text, and story. These three elements are interrelated, they are interdependent, and combine to create new meaning. Elliot Eisner in 1981 wrote, what artistic approaches seek to exploit is the power of the form to inform. The form I've chosen to exploit is that of a graphic novel. Nonfiction graphic texts that have historical backdrops or focus extensively on history and social justice have been rapidly rising in popularity for the past 20, to 20 years. Titles such as Palestine, Persepolis, Macedonia, uh, the 9-11 Report, the March Trilogy, um, Amazon's Abolitionists and Activists, a graphic history of women's fights for their rights. They called us enemies. The Black Panther Party, Redbone, the true story of a Native American rock band. I mean, I have this really long list. Um, uh, these texts are powerful and accessible documents which tell culturally informed stories, explore complexity, and present new ways of understanding events. They allow readers to make choices about the way they read the text and offer more flexibility than line-by-line -line traditional text. The images and writing within graphic text can also enhance the empathy of readers in ways that traditional research may not. Art and literature allow viewers to step into the eyes of another and consider a different point of view. Candace Jesse Stout, a professor at Ohio State, states, it is the aesthetic experience that makes possible privileged moments through which students can live new experiences and move beyond the limitations of the self. Naming this project to satisfy my role and responsibility as an academic becomes really sticky. Can this be considered legitimate research? If so, how would I explain the rationale for my methodology? Is it okay for a privileged white woman from the South to write about interracial violence in Detroit where African Americans were targeted? Julie Armstrong, an author who contributed greatly to my work and understanding of Mary Turner and Detroit in 1943, writes about her experience with the Mary Turner story. This is one of my favorite lines ever. Every liberal Southern white girl has her scout, scout finch fantasy, but this story refused to be my sacrificial mockingbird. Writing this book took me on a journey like no other academic endeavor I've ever experienced. It shook me and made me take a hard look at ways that my lived experiences had not. It helped me contextualize my present day experiences with race, policing, and capitalism through a historical deep dive into the early part of the 20th century. So why is this story still relevant? Why should you want to read this book? Because the effects of white violence are still present. The attention given to police shootings of black unarmed citizens has been a catalyzing spotlight in recent years, despite the long history of police violence and homicide in the United States. It has renewed interest in racism and racial profiling and police brutality. We can see racism in the composition of our schools and neighborhoods. We can see it in our prison system. Our nation locks up more people than any other country on earth. One among many issues that faces our country's disproportionate minority contact. We can see racism and sexism in our health care system. COVID and recent anti-choice transphobic laws and policy have laid that bare. White supremacy was and is propagated by artists, sociologists, lawyers, police, governors, writers, chancellors, presidents, professors, senators, anthropologists, journals, journalists, teachers, and preachers. This list goes on and on. It's easy to say these ideas belong to people who are ignorant, but don't believe that for an instant. 
In the current cultural and political climate, these voices have come forward and shown me that white supremacy, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia will no longer continue to be satisfied to fester in whispers, jokes, backslaps, and remarks that occur behind open palms, on the greens of golf courses, after church, on the clay of tennis courts, as anonymous comments scratched into bathroom stalls, in back rooms, on factory floors, or even backyards. They are out in the open, they are shameless, and they are in our faces. It is our responsibility to create conditions that allow everyone to thrive, conditions that make safe spaces and opportunities for the voices of everyone to be part of the decision-making that takes place in institutions, courtrooms, boardrooms, senate chambers, and classrooms. In particular, the voices like those brave people that testified to the violence in Detroit to write to the, write to the NAACP and sign their names for everyone from that day forward to read. Those who have been eventually silenced by incarceration, capitalism, poverty, fear, marginalization, censorship, and death. We must make spaces for the voice of those that are demonized by rhetoric, those whose very lives are endangered by fear-mongering, rumors, stereotypes, and greed. The story of Detroit in the summer of 1943 should remain in our hearts and minds as an example of how rhetoric and rumors can lead to violence and death. So let's talk about this book. Words and images matter, and as an artist, I try to remember this. In the past 20 years, a number of scholars in the arts and social sciences has sought to answer the question of how to name the intersection where art and research overlap. Some focus on the processes of production, and others focus on the outcomes of and the life of the text beyond the studio. Still others are interested not in the ideas pursued through the text, but the final product as an object or an image. While others see the only way for the visual arts to include art in qualitative research is through the work of scholars who write about the visual arts, not make non-linguistic work. The modes of inquiry I employed in this project are taken mostly from working in my studio, looking at photographs, reading primary and secondary documents, and scholarly research. I've been writing scholarly articles for over two decades and making paintings I would claim for over three decades. My experience in these two endeavors had came together seamlessly for me in this project. One of the things I hope to unpack is a solid understanding of how the translation of literature, first-hand account, historical studies into a graphic historiography adds to the meaning of the original documents. Does the aesthetic experience offered to readers through the interdependent images and text further the project of social and cultural transformation? So these are some of the, I just wanted to share sort of some of the documents. And I really tried to think about, you know, when I first started getting into comics, I really tried to think about, can I do comics and can I do qualitative research? You know, and you can see that I'm really um, working through my position as an academic, right? So at one point, um, I was translating qualitative research, you know, interviews with women in prison and thinking, how does this translate into comics? How does that work? Um, and when I say qualitative research, even though I was doing historical work, I thought about if I was in conversation with these, um, these interviews and these affidavits, and that really was the key sort of anchor for the work that I did. I would also say that, um, you know, poetry was really important to me. Reading the poems of different people um, really played a huge role in the way I thought about what happened in Detroit, and in part because... There are just things you can't read. You know, you have to feel them. You have to go there. You have to see them. You know, I made numerous trips to, to Detroit, walked and drove around all kinds of neighborhoods, talked to people. You know, when you start talking to people in Detroit, they'll be like, oh, yeah, my uncle or my grandma remembers that. This is what happened to them. So it's still very present, you know, as history in that area. Um, and, you know, the archives were uh, just packed with images. And one of the things sort of as an artist that I had to sort of figure out is like, well, one, I really suck at drawing cars. Like, I cannot draw cars at all. And I was like, well, this is a really dumb story for you to try to tell because it's set in Detroit, <laughs> um, which is really known for cars. But so, you know, what were the kind of cars um, people were driving? You know, what did the streets look like? Because obviously, um, Detroit looks very different than it did in the 1940s um, in many ways. So, um, you know, I would say that basically I, I employed what, what I would consider um, a hybridized research system, and that term is taken from Christopher Crouch. 
Um, he basically says, in the visual arts that can offset the claim that creative research in the visual arts is essentially narcissistic because it operates outside the dominant institutional discourse. He calls for visual artists in academia to engage in praxis. Specifically, he points to the work of Habermas and his ideas of performative acts and the work of Anthony Giddens. And his ideas relate to reflexivity. Krauss draws parallels to the profession of nursing and the idea that there should be more emphasis on the creative processes of the visual arts rather than the final product. He sees the process of creating art as an engagement in what Habermas would call a communicative act with emancipatory potential that's not only personally significant to the creator but also ethically and socially important. Um, so at this panel I'll share with you, you really can't see it, but it, along the top is a piece of poetry um, from Jim Daniels, and Jim Daniels is a poet, and he writes just amazing pieces about Detroit, and he had this wonderful piece about sort of remembering what happened in 1943, and so initially my idea was to sort of weave different poets and poetry throughout. The other person that deeply inspired me is Philip Levine, um, and he wrote a poem about Belle Isle um, that really, if you ever go to Belle Isle, I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but it's a magical, beautiful, amazing place. And the history of Belle Isle feels so deep. You cross over the bridge and you just feel like you're in a, a completely different space. And it's a very um, communal community kind of space. You know, if you go in the evenings, people have lawn chairs out. If you walk, there's like a long kind of sidewalk walk you can do, and people will talk, and they sit in the grass on blankets. I mean, it's just a beautiful, beautiful space um, to be. So I would say those things were really um, important. And, you know, I would say that um, uh, I, I really wanted to flesh out the context for readers um, and storytellers through body language, through appearance, through what people were wearing. And this is where the work, you know, my own work crosses into what it, in some ways is creative nonfiction. I'll never forget I had this great conversation with Corey in this coffee shop. Corey has played a tremendous role in the sort of birth of this book. Um, and I think Corey is the midwife of comics. So, you know, when you look at their CV, it's like phenomenal how many, how many books they have sort of helped bring into the world. But I was sitting in the coffee shop and I started this project in 2004. Um, and the publication didn't come out till 2021. So if that tells you anything, you know, it's been a really consuming um, and a love-hate sort of project. So the, when I first started this, I was like terrified of historians. Um, and I'm a huge like historian fangirl. And so I was like, oh my God, I don't want to do anything that my history colleagues will see as like, you know, not okay. And so they were very, I'd been, I'd worked on a project about Wilmington in 1898, um, and done some other uh, work sort of around historical um, events. And I had teamed with historians, and they were just like, you cannot make things up. Like, you can't make things up. You can't change quotes. You can't change the way people look. Like, if you make things up, the devil will open up a hole and swallow you. Like, bad, bad things will happen. So I was very, like, stuck, you know, or I was like, well, I can only find this much of this conversation. I can't find an image of this person. And you'll notice in my book, there's a lot of hands. There's a lot of cigarettes, too. I love cigarettes. But the hands are usually when there was a real person, I could not find an image. I mean, I scoured obituaries. I looked through yearbooks, and I just couldn't find pictures of people. Um, but Corey said, and he just, it was nothing to him, but it, like, completely changed everything for me. He was like, why are you so worried about this? He's like, tell a story. You can make up stories that happen in Detroit during this time based on the historical knowledge. I was like, oh, my God. You know, it was like he touched my forehead and said, you will be healed. I mean, it really <laughs> felt like that to me. And so it opened up this whole different kind of creative space where I was like, I had all these gaps where I couldn't make the story match because there were things missing. And so he really helped me make that. He, he gave me permission, I would say, to make that space in my work. And so it is an interesting piece in that much of it is based on history. And if someone was real, I never put words in their mouth. But then I also made up people and made up sort of things happening. So, um, okay. Uh, 
Oh, uh, let's see. I talked about that. Talked about that. Okay. So, um, so I want to start really by talking about um, this is another you know issue and instance where I was really drawn to what did Detroit look like? Um, what was the landscape like? What was happening in the streets? What were different parts of Detroit look like? And you know, over that course of time, so many interesting things came out about Detroit. Detroit's experiencing this beautiful renaissance, sort of rebirth. Um, I would encourage you if you're in your 20s and you don't know what to do with your life next, Detroit is the place to go. I think it's a very uh, a fertile spot. But so recreating Detroit was actually really hard. So this woman, Emily Cuddle, if I ever get to meet her, I'm going to hug her neck. She found these pictures of different neighborhoods and she was actually able to piece them together sort of based on GPS data so you could actually see the neighborhood that was now you know no longer present um, in the form that it would have been at that point in time so like finding her archive was also a game changer for me I was like you can go and look at Detroit and there's a lot of bits and pieces but they're not anything like they were obviously in the 1940s um, so you know I would just say that the archive that I went to was was pretty, um, I went to a lot of different places to look for things. So um, let me talk about what happened in Detroit a little bit. Um, this is Belle Isle. Belle Isle is so beautiful. You must go there. But you can see in trying to put together things like going to Belle Isle, I had to look and see what is the architecture of the ironwork that's at Belle Isle? What does the bridge look like? You know, these are newspaper um, clippings from that time. And the history of Belle Isle is really interesting. Um, initially, it was filled with rattlesnakes, and then the French put pigs to eat the rattlesnakes, so it had this name, um, which I will not say because I have a very fat southern tongue and I'll just butcher it. But um, the history, you know, all of these deep histories exist in Detroit, and 1943 sort of floats on top of them. So um, if we talk about, um, I did, I, I tried to sort of say what happened. So I'll go back. One of the stories that I tell is the story of Robert Gordon. And you can see in this page where the actual affidavits from these two women are form the backdrop. And I wanted to do that to be transparent about where these words are coming from. Um, and so one of these is Louise Robertson and the other is Eva Gordon. And they, their, their brother and their son were part of a group of young people that went to Belle Isle on the day that violence broke out in June and were just hanging out and suddenly were swept up into this terrible violence, were arrested by police and literally <coughs> disappeared into the Detroit um, court system. You know, like their family went looking for them and could not find them, didn't know where they were, didn't know if they were dead or alive, didn't know what hospital they were out or, or if they had been arrested. So you can imagine, you know, if your child went to hang out with friends and didn't come home and this is happening and your child is a black child, how terrifying that would be. Um, so that's one of the stories I tell. So the story of Robert Gordon begins on Belle Isle. He's a young black man. He's inducted to be inducted into the Army June 21st. Um, he joins a group of friends on a short trip. They're leaving the island to attend a farewell party in his honor. Their car is pulled over and searched by police, and one of the young men had a pen knife. Um, the police arrested Gordon and his three male companions. Their families were not informed of their arrest. They were held in custody while their families searched for them in hospitals and police stations across Detroit. When Robert's mother finally found him, he was in court and had been sentenced to 90 days in jail. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but in no way should we cast blame on a young person enjoying an afternoon with friends. Instead, it's clear through his story that the white police in Detroit use racial profiling and violence to single out young black men and perpetrate this violence through their callous interactions with fam the families of victims. The events of that day would shape Robert's life in unexpected ways. He was lucky to escape with his life, but the experience marked him. For example, he never did join the Army. After the police squelched the violence on Belle Isle, rumors began to spread in black and white communities, and the rumors included accounts of African -American, an African-American mother and her baby being thrown off a bridge by white hooligans and a white sailor and his girlfriend being killed by a gang of black youths. Neither one of these things is true. The rumors spread in Paradise Valley and Cass Corridor, and according to Patricia Turner, rumors and riots enjoy a near-parasitic attachment. She points to the rumors that spread like wildfire through both the white and black communities as part of what she calls the Topsy Eva cycle. Each rumor is specifically designed to play into violent race and gender-based stereotypes held by both groups. 
Within the text, I explore each of these rumors with the stories that illuminate their impact on the violence in Detroit in June of 1943. These stories are based on firsthand accounts recorded by the NAACP and sworn affidavits taken shortly after the uprising by Thurgood Marshall and others affiliated with the NAACP. I portray the story of Samuel Mitchell, who was pulled from a streetcar by an angry white mob. This is Julian Witherspoon. Um, this is Samuel Mitchell. Um, uh, and stabbed as he traveled to work at Bankers Trust Company. He had no idea this was happening. So he just got up on a Monday morning, went downtown like he always did on a streetcar, and suddenly he's in the middle of just horrible, terrible, frightening things where people were literally pulled through the windows of the streetcar and beaten. Cars were set on fire, turned over. I mean, it, it was absolutely terrifying. And he's, he was lucky to escape with his life. He thought he had been shot. And he came off the streetcar. There were three loud pops. He looks and he's bleeding. And of course, he's completely panicked because he's in a sea of angry white people, mostly men. He goes to the police. They will not help him. He eventually gets to um, the hospital. And once he gets there and he's you know, cleaned up, there's so much blood, the doctor says, actually, you were stabbed. You weren't shot. So I mean, imagine that kind of melee where you don't even know what's happening to your body in that moment. And there's no one to help you in a crowd of thousands. I mean, really really something. And just on your way to work, you know, he had worked at that place for tw over 20 years. So, um, you know, and, and his story is actually interesting because it really counters the narrative that many sociologists in the 1940s posted, which is that, oh, the people involved in this riot and that were harmed were young, you know, black juvenile men and poor white men. And that's actually not true. You can look at the pictures and see that that's absolutely not at all um, what was going on. Uh, never again did Detroit or any city in the United States experience an uprising quite like the one in June of 1943. While the civil rights movement changed the expectations, policies, and um, behaviors of most Americans on the public playing field, racism continues to exist in this country and foment tension. White supremacists, transphobic voters, politicians, and conservative Christians are promoting harmful conspiracies doubling down and sanctioning violence against wide swaths of people who do not share their views and identities. Police are militarized and have killed numerous innocent people without remorse or oversight. While this account positions black and white people in a binary, it presents a way that white communities overlooked issues of ethnicity, nationality, class, and culture to unite against those they perceived as other, as non-white. This pattern has been repeated and was highly visible in the last election in our current political landscape, where there has been a tremendous uptick in the popularity of the Great Replacement Theory. Whites are, in fact, slated to become a minority in the United States in the near future. White supremacist politicians have made immigration, crime, and the economy three major talking points. They're trying to resurrect an image of white heteropatriarchy, which is embodied in manga and MAGA, sorry, MAGA, and is not in manga, sorry, in uh, MAGA, and it's impossible to deny that Trump took a page straight from the playbook of fascism. If you look at what was happening coming up to the riot, it was exactly almost the same thing. I mean, you had Father Coughlin on the radio saying terrible things. You had flyers like the ones that I showed you. Obviously, there was great racial foment happening in this country because of the war against people who were Asian, against people who were black. Um, so it's a really, you know, ironically, while we're overseas fighting for human rights. Um, so one of the things I talk about in the book is obviously the, the double V for victory campaign. There's a lot of things that lead up to that, but I can't help but see the parallels between then and now. The other thing I wanted to do with this story is just to show like the everydayness that, you know, when I used to take students into the women's prison, I would say, you know, they would expect this really like horrible, where everyone's like in fetal positions, miserable and terrible. And in fact, they would be surprised. I'm like, no, you will see women playing cards. You will see women laughing. They will be joking. They will joke with you. You know, it doesn't feel like you might think. And the reality is that our humanity ekes out. You know, we do create joy all the time in certain spaces. And so I wanted to also show that, yes, this riot is going on, but there's just an everydayness of life that's also happening. You know, people are kissing each other goodbye for work. You know, they're brushing their teeth. They're holding babies. They're eating donuts. They're smoking cigarettes. Like, life goes on in the face of all of these terrible things. And it's pretty amazing that it does. You know, if you think about how can we be confronted with this horrible violence but still go home and eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I mean, humans are really interesting creatures. Um, so uh, 
Um, so, the, you know, these are just everyday things uh, that were happening. Um, the other thing that was interesting about the riot is the role that politicians played, where politicians were sort of existing in this complete and utter bubble and saying, you know, one saying, don't worry, we've got this handled. Well, clearly it wasn't handled and things were getting out of hand. And it's what I also see is the parallels to, to January 6th you know, where things were beginning to happen. They knew things were going to happen January 6th. They weren't prepared. Obviously, things went sideways and people died, um, and they were very slow to respond. So the same thing happened in this instance with the uprising, where people were losing their lives. They were being pulled off streetcars and beaten, and they kept saying, oh, we think the police can handle this, which obviously they were part of the problem. Um, and it took a really long time for things to get better, like three days of hell. Um, so I also wanted to sort of talk about where politicians found themselves and how their egos and their unwillingness to act and their denial that this is happening for a number of different reasons. I mean, much of it had to do with capitalism um, really, you know, didn't do this. So if you think about the toll um, of what happened with the uprising, 34 people died, 25 were black and nine were white. 17 black people were fatally shot by police, 670 people were injured, 75 people were injured, 2,000 people were arrested and detained by police, $2 million in property damage, and there was like a lot of time lost. And this is just sort of what's documented, so you can imagine what's undocumented. You can imagine the people that, you know, went home, didn't tell anyone that the reason they had a bump on their head is because someone punched them, right? Um, so, and, and again, it's really hard to know the true toll um, of what happened, and also this sort of generational toll. You know, I can't imagine how Samuel Mitchell must have felt trying to get back on a streetcar and go back to work, you know, and to explain what had happened to him. Um, there were a lot of stories where people were just swept up in the random violence of it. And what really led up to it, and again, this is also interesting when I think about current times, housing shortages. Um, there were not enough places, and obviously Detroit has a lot um, a long history of redlining, and you can physically see it even today. You can see the wall, you know, the eight-mile wall. Um, contested spaces, who can be in what spaces? So recreational spaces, Belle Isle was a very contested space. You know, who can be on this island when? Um, double V for victory and Jim Crow. Um, the arsenal of democracy, so really retooling for war, you know, when you have a whole city economy that shuts down and reopens, and there's a whole hierarchy of who can work and who can't, and what jobs people can do, um, you see a lot of unrest and the need for jobs. There was a ton of labor unrest. There was a lot of organizing happening, which was really good. Ford played plays a huge role in this, but Ford was not the only one. His story for me was the most, the easiest, and in some ways most complicated to tell. Um, and that whole chapter is interesting. He had the largest private, basically, police force um, in the country at that time. And they were absolute uh, thugs. I and mean, that's the only word I can really use that adequately describes the, the group of men that he pulled together to terrorize workers. Um, there was also this brutality and a very complicated relationship with the black community. The Ford Motor Company is a great case study. I would encourage anyone who's interested to look deeply at that. And again, Harry Bennett Ford was his, um, the head of his service department, and he had been a boxer, and he was just, and they, you know, chose people because those people had violent tendencies. Um, and the thing is that Leaders knew this was going to happen. So this is Walter White, and a number of people said Detroit is going to explode. There's going to be problems. So again, when you think about um, January 6th and people sounding the alarm, even now, um, and people didn't didn't take heed. And he so he said this on June 3rd, and of course things broke out um, later in that month, not you know weeks later. So pretty crazy. Um, so I just want to sort of end. It was so interesting today. I was reading this review in The Atlantic of this book called American Midnight, The Great War, A Violent Peace and Democracy's Forgotten Crisis. Um, and it's written by George Packer and the book's by Adam Hochschild. But the author noted, the author is a novelist, historian, essayist, and journalist. And he writes, a nativist panic runs like a continuous underground stream beneath the calmer, more open stretches of American history, always on the verge of bubbling up. 
The Red Scare, McCarthyism, and um, MAGA all seem fed by the same source. The recurring fear among real Americans, and he's divided America into these four different Americans, which is kind of really fascinating, but that's another book, um, that the homeland is threatened by foreigners, traders, and alien ideologies, which is exactly what happened here. Um, even some people after the uprising ended and they created all these commissions to find out what happened, some people said it was the, you know, the KKK. Some people said, no, it was the fifth column. It was Nazis that came in. I mean, there were all these wild conspiracies about what had actually happened without acknowledging the role that they, you know, policymakers played in, in creating a setting for this. Um, so he writes, to keep these dark forces from overwhelming American society once again will require a lot from us. He concludes in American Midnight, knowledge of our history for one thing, so we can better see danger signals and the first drumbeats of demagoguery. So I really believe that graphic novels play a role in that work and have a role to play. And I think as artists, creators, writers, and readers, and audiences, we also play a role. So that's, um, that's it. <laughs> so thank you. And I still have my Iowa address, which is not right. <laughs> so all right. So we should take a break, and then we can have our next panel, don't you think? Yes. <laughs> Hi, um, it was great to hear you. Uh, I had a question about this, uh, like creativity that you allowed yourself to, to like dip into that this moment after you talked to Corian that you said, okay, maybe I can imagine these things. Um, I'd like to know more <laughs> about sure. that, about that part, about sure. the creativity and how did that allow you to actually just say different things that maybe because I do consider that sometimes creativity kind of opens like a different freedom for, for nonfiction yeah, works. Yeah, absolutely. So, for example, the very end of the book, like, See. and this is, you know, my constant problem as an academic and as a writer, how do you end this? You know, what's the freaking conclusion, right? Um, and so the very end of the book, I was like, this is such a dark and horrible story, and I don't want to leave people like, in a terrible, awful place, because Detroit is not that place. Detroit is a beautiful place filled with, I mean, like the best music, the best food, the best art. There is so much innovation, you know, in Detroit. So I did not want to leave people with like this 1943, one month in Detroit idea. So I was trying to imagine how to end it. So I ended it in this place outside of Detroit called Eden, where a number of, of black people left. They left the city after the, um, you know, the events of, of that summer. And I was trying to imagine them, these people sort of in, right after Martin Luther King was assassinated, and how they would, you know, they were older people, how they would look back on what had happened in Detroit, their you know, the lives of their children in the aftermath, you know, what had happened for that family. And so, like, I imagine this woman as a dressmaker. I imagine this man as, like, having a very legitimate and wonderful and very successful business. You know, they're sitting on the porch. Their kids have just come. You know, their kids are like, I never want to live in Detroit. I want to be a lawyer. Why would you do that? You know, and she basically sort of says, Detroit's an amazing city. It's going to rise again from the ashes one of these days, despite what's happening now. You know, I was imagining, like, this is the late 60s. Despite that, things will get better, um, you know. And so that's just one example of like this imagination space. Another one I thought about was like the women um, who protested the Sojourner Truth housing um, development, which was one of the first places built for black workers in Detroit, like the first sort of public housing. They were like, we're actually going to build houses for people because they are citizens of our city, just like everybody else, right, white developers. But they built it next to a middle class um, black community that also butted up against a white Polish community. And the white Polish community basically came together and there was like a small, um, it, well, it wasn't small. There was a huge sort of uh, moment where you had um, African Americans on one side of the street and Polish, many Polish women and their children on the other. And then the men came to protect the women. Like there's all this stuff. So I was trying to imagine what would be the conversation two Polish women would have in the grocery store sort of 
rationalizing why this was important to them. You know, why would you spend time doing this, you know, when you've got other things going on? And, of course, these women didn't work because you didn't work at that point. There's a whole, that's a whole sort of imaginary that I went to. So I would just say instances like that. You know, when I read Philip Levine's poem, I had this idea in my head of what would it be like to skinny dip on Belle Isle, you know, with someone that you're, like, attracted to. How would that be? And, and how does that transform Belle Isle as this other magical space? So, you know, I would just say... Those are kind of the ways that I dipped in, but I needed those. You know, I had these blocks of story, but they didn't connect. They just kind of, and when I, that was for me, reading history, that's how I often feel. It's like this thing happened, and this thing happened, and this thing happened, but there, I can't connect, like, and then what, you know? And all the people that are there are, like, famous people with names. And I'm like, what about all the people that were affected by this or that were living it at that time? And so that's kind of what, you know, where that happened for me. So thank you for that question. Gracias. Thank you. Um, so much of what, you, what you've described is so similar to the Black Wall Street massacre mm -hmm. in Tulsa. Yes. I'm wondering, in terms of memories, how is it similar or different the way survivors and uh, descendants of survivors t think about it and talk about it? You know, I think Tulsa, you know, the compare, there's definitely parallels there with what happened in 1921 in Tulsa. I think there's also some things that are not parallel. So, for example, you know, nobody, like they just found bodies, you know, a mass grave of people that were killed in Tulsa. Like it was... It was literally buried, what happened in Tulsa. The same thing happened with Wilmington in 1898. So, you know, where it was white violence, pure white violence. Um, and, you know, when, and I use the word uprising and I use the word rebellion, but the scholarship hasn't in many ways caught up with those things. So a lot of the scholarship around these things, you know, would be riot. And, and the reasons these things happen are very, like there's a whole typology of why these different things happen. In, you know, in Tulsa, there was this white replacement ideology that totally happened where people saw Black Wall Street as like this you know, amazing things. Suddenly there was competition in ways there hadn't been before, and people were prosperous, right? Detroit was very different in that, you know, there was no, at some point the pressure built up so extensively, you know, there was no room, there was no jobs, there were no places for people to go to talk about these things. You know, the, the black churches played a huge role in trying to navigate that and make that better and, and literally save lives. But like, and the summer that the uprising happened, it was hot. It was so, so hot. You know, I don't know. Well, I know you have been in the Midwest when it's like in, it's 100 degrees and you're just frying like an egg on the open prairie, right? So, you know, that's how that day was. And um, the other thing that I think was happening is, you know, World War II is, is looming large. And so people were afraid What's going to happen? How can I help? How am I not allowed to help? Why, are, why is this happening there, but this is not happening here? Um, there was intense surveillance, you know, and people had moved, black people and white Southerners had moved to Detroit looking for a better life, and it was not there. You know, it was not happening, and they were finding that even though Jim Crow was not formally in place, it was still existing. And so there was this moment of like, this can't, we can't do this anymore, you know, and there was just such tension. So people, there was a really good reason for the back and forth. And when I've talked to people in Detroit who have memories of their families who were involved in that, there's not a lot of people that um, are necessarily alive that could elaborate extensively about what happened, but there are a lot of people who had, you know, moms and dads and grandparents. Um, it's really mixed because there was looting, there was um, there was literally interracial violence, and um, and people remember like you know being caught in their daily lives, like going to like if it would be like if we went to the Englert to see a show, and when we suddenly let out, there was a thousand people in the street, and there was blood, and people were being beaten, and you couldn't get home, you know. Um, 
So I think there are definitely parallels. I absolutely see that, and I can easily draw those. But I also think that Detroit in 1943, what happened was somewhat unique and really marked this specific turning point in history. You know, and especially the other thing that's super interesting about Detroit and in looking at it, all these names come up, you know, as people that were just starting to be deeply involved in the civil rights, um, you know, in in what would later become the civil rights, um, the era of the civil rights. And, you know, I'm just like, wow, you were doing this when you were this age and then 30 years later, you know, this is how you're thinking about things. So that was kind of fascinating to me, too. I'm not really answering your question very well. I'm kind of going on a rant. But but there are a lot of parallels. But Detroit, what happened in 43 was really unique. I mean, especially in comparison to, like, what happened in Harlem, what happened in L.A. There's definitely threads, but they were all sort of very different, I guess you could say, reasons and then reactions to what happened. So good question. Thank you. Thank you for coming. You shared the panel in which you had the um, testimony behind Mm -hmm. the folks who were speaking, and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about other ways that you came up with symbolic shorthand for attribution and citation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's kind of funny. So I honestly abandoned this project so many times, and um, I am not a historian, and people that know me know that I am very unorganized. So after being in the archives for like 13 or 14 years, I had these scribbly notebooks. I had like random note cards, and I had sort of made notes and done like attributions like you would an APA paper, but you know, again, historians are very specific and unique individuals, and they are... I mean, detail-oriented and organized. I mean, they have, like, these superpowers in terms of, like, memory and knowing what's what. So I sent this to my editor, and she was like, uh, 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 no, 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 no. You're, you're going to have to actually go back and write footnotes for all this. And I was like, you're fucking out of your mind. <laughs> I mean, I literally, like, cried and, like, beat my, you know, hands on the counter. And I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I can't do this. I can't do this. So I had to piece together a series of really detailed footnotes. I had like three milk crates full of books I had been purchasing and had highlighted, and I wrote in the books thing. So I was like, oh, yeah, this passage came from this person. They tracked it down. And then, honestly, without my iPhone, I could never have recreated my archival journey, you know, because I just went to so many places, and I would be like, oh, yeah, there's the photograph of this piece of paper, which I got from this thing. So I did end up writing extensive footnotes for everything, which was like, probably the most painful experience of my life. Um, It was awful. And um, I'm so thankful that the UNC press was so kind and understanding. Um, But I would say, you know, I do have slips of paper. I have, like, newspapers. And even one of the things, I don't have an image of it here, but, like, those bills, the handbills where people were, like, come to this meeting, you know, trying to get permission to reproduce those was a pain in the butt. So I, like, literally just drew them by hand, which was awful. Um, But for me, less painful than trying to go through the process of getting the copyright. And, you know, that just tells you sort of how avoidant (laughs) some of my behavior was. Um, But I would say there's definitely moments like that where I have real, you know, um, pieces of ephemera that really reflect what's happening um, there. And Uh, I really wanted to do that. And the second book I did that really came out of this um, is a book about a lynching in um, a series of lynchings in South Georgia. And it's it's much more of that where I'm like, here's an actual telegram from, you know, one person to another. And here's this newspaper clipping. And so I think, you know, I'm not a great comic artist. I I work like an artist, really. And um, and collage is a huge part of the things that I do. Um, the other thing that was really interesting about this book is, like, when I started, I did everything by hand. And, of course, technology finally evolved to where I was like, I think I can draw on my iPad now, which I couldn't because before I just had, like, this scratchy Wacom tablet, and it was too slow to keep up with the drawing. It was terrible. Um, so, you, you know, you can see that through the book, too. But, yeah, I really did try to make it, it you know, if you read it, it's, there's a lot there. It's a slog. I mean, I tell people it's a real slog to read that book. Um, but it is, it is densely detailed uh, in terms of what, where things came from and, and attributions and stuff. So good question. And I think this and is going to be our last Yay. question. <laughs> okay. 
I'm like sweating up here. I just want y'all to know. <laughs> I'm dying. Thank you so much for this talk. I was compelled in the beginning when you were talking about the kind of moments when you were starting this research about your own positionality, your mm -hmm. whiteness, your kind of own history and mm -hmm. how that met up with writing all of this. And I kind of wanted to hear you talk more because sure. I think especially as more and more white scholars take up work on race and racial trauma and violence, there's a lot more to positionality and the kind of politics mm -hmm. of that. And especially the point that you made about trying to get, engage the, the visceralness of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that I was thinking a little bit about how poorly that's often done with like slavery simulations. And I've just done some research on those sorts of experiential learning where white teachers are like, I need to do this because I don't know how else to engage it. And it seems like you were trying to get at the like politics of feeling and the felt affective realness of everything without slipping into that like fetishizing and so I just want to hear more about like your own like identity how that factored into like the work that you're doing because I sense that intentionality and yeah. would love to just hear more about that I mean absolutely I would say you know I think white scholars should be writing about white violence you know so often the stories are about you know this is what happened and they're passive in that nature they're they're not naming who did that and why did they do that you know so in my mind this is very much, and it's really interesting because when I was reading um, many of the, the earlier texts, you know, I would say 1970 to 1944 texts, it was a story of black violence, you know, which is fascinating, and, um, and it really isn't. You know, when you do go into the archive and you do begin to read, yes, there was, I mean, there's no doubt about it. There was definitely black violence happening, you know, but with good reason. <laughs> um, I think it's, there's a difference between violence and self-defense. I guess that's one thing I would say. But I do think white scholars should be writing about white violence, you know, and naming it and saying what it is. I had issues because, so I had written, and I really like my, latest project is really centered in North Carolina, where I'm from. I'm not from Detroit, you know, and so I also was like, what does it mean for me as an academic to swoosh into the city and tell a story about it that's an awful story? You know, it's a shameful story um, that says shameful things about the politicians. So, for example, you know, going back to this idea of imagination, Mayor Jeffries figures looms large in this, and he's a very interesting character. Like, at one point, he literally goes to Florida and plays golf while these things are happening. So like, yeah. So, um, and I made him worse than he actually is. So, I mean, I feel a little bit bad about that. But, uh, you know, I do think that's something that's really important. And I said, you know, I need to go to Detroit and see if it's okay to tell the story. See if I feel like that's the right thing to do. And in looking at accounts of Detroit, there wasn't, the, the, that story hadn't been told, you know. And really, um, the thing that kind of amazed me is the, the, the voices of black women had been left out, you know, and the experiences of black women, both as organizers and with real agency. Um, and really what you find in the archives is that really for every social movement that was happening in Detroit, there were black women behind it, you know, kicking ass and taking names. Um, so I have this, I fell absolutely in love with the Black Housewives League of Detroit. And they were, they like started fires. They were like such badass women with gloves and hats and little purses. And like, I was like, oh my God, these women. So, but I do think this is a story of white violence. You know, when you look at the police force, I think, I think there were nine black officers on the police force out of like, a tremendous, like 4,300 officers or something like crazy. I mean, I may, I'm pro don't quote me on that because I'm terrible with numbers, but this really is a story of white violence. And, you know, the other thing about it is, is um, I also had to interrogate my ideas about World War II. You know, my family was in World War II. They lived in Tennessee at the time. You know, there's definitely, we benefited from racism tremendously. You know, there's no way to deny that. Um, and my grandmother's accounts of World War II really had a very whitewashed version of things. You know, they, they both existed in the Jim Crow South and benefited from the Jim Crow South. Um, and as much as I would love to say, oh, they didn't lie, I, I don't think that's true. You know, I think they actually benefited tremendously and felt like, oh, this is the way. So seeing how Southerners migrated to Detroit brought those ideas with them and how that really increased the violence and how people who were not from the South took up those those ideas, you know. Um, 
so, I mean, I did do a lot of interrogation. Really, this book made me think through that. And I really have massively fallen in love with Detroit. And I've brought people to Detroit to say, you know, and I've made wonderful connections and tried to sort of, um, you know, I donated my archive to the public library there. And, and you know, it's, a, it's an amazing story and it just hadn't been told. So I thought, well, I, it's okay if I tell the story. I think it's okay. Um, I would say where I interrogated myself much more deeply was the Mary Turner story. Um, and that was a very, that was an interesting um, experience in whiteness and southernness. Um, and, uh, you know, Julie Armstrong, I wish she was here. She's like my idol. She, she talks about it extensively and just how, how to think about those things. And again, that quote, you know, this is not going to be your Scout Finch fantasy is really quite good. So, but I do think there is a need to, to position yourself and think about how to tell stories. And I tried very hard, like I said, to find images of people. I was really thoughtful about how do you draw people. You know, you don't, if you're working in black and white, you know, it's a very, it's a really interesting way to think about how do you draw people and, and show who's who. And you, you know, I don't know, there's just a lot, a lot of interesting things to think about there. But anyway, again, I didn't answer your question very well, but <laughs> thank you for asking it. Okay, y'all should all have tea and cookies and you know, do wonderful things. So thank you for coming today.